for all the lawyers in the audience, this program has been accredited uh, by the LSO, so it contains one hour of EDI professionalism content. Welcome those of you who are just tuning in now and welcome back to those who joined us for the morning session. Before I get into our introductions, I would like to start by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are attending from today. While we meet virtually for this event, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands in which we each call home. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. I would like to personally acknowledge the land that I am presenting from today, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I would also like to acknowledge that the topics that are being discussed in today's presentation are sensitive subjects that can bring up a variety of emotions, and we encourage you to take the space that you need. We would also like to highlight a resource that is available through the Law Society of Ontario called the Member Assistance Program, if you're not familiar with it already, and members can access that through calling the LSO should you need any support following the program. So some of the topics that the panel will be covering today are EDI awareness, EDI and the workplace basics, initials, acronyms, and EDI language ac acquisition, addressing power imbalances, microaggressions, unconscious bias, conscious competence, and lastly, accountability of individuals and organizations. We welcome you to send in questions for the panelists through the Q&A, and they'll do their best to address as many as they can throughout the presentation. And now, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our next speakers. So Susanna Allen is the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Council and the Equity Abundance Person of the Law Society of Alberta. Her work focuses on making the legal profession more inclusive and provide support to those facing discrimination or harassment in the workplace. Next, we have Joe, who is a founding partner of Sheridan, Ippolito and Family and Estates Lawyers. Joe is an enthusiastic collaborative law practitioner and formerly sat on the board of Collaborative Divorce Toronto. He is currently a member of the EDI committee of the CDT Association, and he is also a panel lawyer for the Office of the Children's Lawyer and the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. In the past, he has sat on numerous boards of not-for-profit organizations relating to the support and advancement of vulnerable persons. Last but not least, we have Jane Ha, who is a collaborative family lawyer and a senior associate lawyer at Russell Alexander Collaborative Lawyers. Jane currently serves as the chair of the Collaborative Divorce Toronto and is the former chair of the EDI committee at CDT. Her interest in promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion principles in her workplace and organizations has led to initiatives to establish scholarships for EDI community and to facilitate educational discussions on a topic like this one. So now I would love to pass it over to you, Jane, to take it away from here. Thanks so much, Shannon. And thank you everyone for joining us in this, uh, I think what I think is a really important conversation to have with everyone, especially uh, those, those of us who work in the legal community. So I think that there has been a greater awareness of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and so the acronyms EDI or DEI has entered common parlance. Um, I, I know that Susanna actually works in this area. So I wonder, Susanna, is that true that do you think that this um, you know, public awareness of the importance of EDI principles have become a lot more commonplace in the, in the recent years. Uh, what do you think? Oh, uh, thanks for the question, Jane. And first, I just wanna say thanks for having me. And I wanna just like, take a moment to acknowledge that I'm appearing from Calgary, Alberta today, which is the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples of the Treaty 7 region and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, to your question about things being more common in terms of EDI wording or even acronyms and those sorts of things in our lexicon, I think, yes. I think we sort of have a groundswell around the conversation of what equity, diversity, and inclusion mean right now. Um, I think there are a few points in history that we can point to, but most recently, um, I would say, 
you know, the brutal murder of George Floyd was certainly a modern day catalyst for the revival of certain discussions and then the birth of new ways, I think, of having those discussions. Um, I think depending on the environment you find yourself in, there will be folks that have varying degrees of knowledge or even comfortability in engaging with those words or that kind of material. Um, in my training that I developed for our organization for the profession, I like to think that we're all on our individual journey about what it means to live equitably while celebrating diversity and building inclusion in our workspaces. Um, and I think it's encouraging to see discussions like the one we're having today coming to the forefront of how we live, how we work, how we play. Um, but I also recognize that there are some inherent tensions there. Um, I think for those who've lived and experienced bias and discrimination because of who they are, um, there is some exhaustion around dialogue without action. Um, I think for many, change cannot come quickly enough. And then I think there are um, some of the folks among us who may feel more like they're experiencing a steep learning curve um, around the reality of what their friends or their neighbors or their colleagues um, have been experiencing. And I think that can also be overwhelming. Wow, uh, that's already a lot to think about. Thank you, Susanna. Um, I just want to take a quick audience poll. Um, have you participated, for those of you uh, who are listening to our conversation, um, in EDI training in the past year? Can you please um, take a moment to um, answer in our poll pop up? Okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, when we talk about EDI, um, I think that there are um, some people who are very open to these discussions who want to find out more, but they don't quite uh, understand how it affects them or if it's relevant to them at all. Um, so I want to ask the question, who, who um, are, we, are we focusing on when we look at EDI initiatives? Um, I know that, um, that Susanna has a lot to say about this, but I want to bring Joe into the conversation at this point. Joe, can you, can you talk about um, EDI in the workplace? I know you, uh, you're an owner of a law firm, you're an employer, obviously we serve a lot of clients. Can you talk about EDI uh, from different perspectives? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, first off, I certainly do not consider myself an expert in this field, but it is something that we think about um, and talk about. So that's what I can maybe add to this conversation. In terms of my work history, I, I started off in a very large uh, Bay Street firm and uh, I've worked in a small partnership and I've worked in association with other lawyers and other legal professionals. And I also am a, um, a, a contract worker for the province of Ontario. So I've had a lot of different experience and different capacities as both an employee and a partner and a, um, a workmate. Um, and uh, I think that um, in terms of how these issues are important, they're important in terms of who we're working with whether it's uh, colleagues that we're working with directly as uh, partners or employees, and also people who we're working with on the other side of a case, but more importantly, in terms of our clients. And um, so being aware of EDI issues cannot do you wrong in any of these dealings, whether it's your colleagues or clients or government uh, agencies, this being aware of EDI issues makes you a more effective coworker, uh, an effective professional. And um, so in my view, the EDI is something, training and consideration of this and thinking about it is uh, something for everyone. And it can do us good in terms of our own personal selves, but also in terms of being more effective professional. I absolutely agree. Thank you, Joe. Um, so when Joe um, talks about uh, EDI issues, um, Susanna, do you have thoughts on uh, what kind of issues are important, uh, you know, within this uh, dialogue? 
Yeah, I think definitely agree with Joe in terms of EDI initiatives are for everyone. I think depending on how they're being deployed and what the goals are, that may look different. Um, you know, I start from the basis of none of us are are winning with the systems we currently have in place. Some of us receive more benefits than others, um, but a workplace where inequality persists is not to anyone's benefit. Um, so I think some initiatives are about consciousness raising, you know, and that can be to everyone's benefit. But I think for those who find themselves saying, you know, I'm really experiencing um, a learning curve that I'm unfamiliar with here, or I really need to get familiar with the lexicon in this area. Um, I think that can be very beneficial. And I think for those specifically who don't belong to the equity deserving groups that we recognize, that can be a really great entry point in just terms of getting some more knowledge around that. I think other initiatives are built to amplify the voices of those that belong to particular, particular equity deserving groups. And in those cases, I think the goals of deployment will look different. The focus may be on supporting those groups, providing additional resources, retaining, um, promoting and advancing them in the workplace and those sorts of things. Um, as a former family practitioner, um, you know, I thought about EDI initiatives within the small firm setting. Um, and it was everything from, okay, well, what are the days of recognition to what does our social media presence look like to how are we educating ourselves about working with clients and about and educating clients about working with us, depending on what our, our team looks like. So I think there are a couple entry points depending on what it is you want to accomplish. I think that's great. I um, I love the term amplifying voices. I mean, because that's the only way um, we can all, uh, you know, contribute uh, to to the well being of you know our workplace. People who are um, feeling um, that they do need the initiatives in place in the workplace. Um, um, I just want to go to a second poll before we get into more of sort of the nitty gritty conversation of what does that look like. Um, so should EDI training in the workplace be formal, informal, mandatory, ongoing? Um, if you don't mind taking a quick look at the questions and uh, giving us a response, that would be great. I, it, it's. I mean, I know we uh, have set up uh, this uh, discussion as sort of a three-way conversation that Josanna and I are having, but we certainly uh, really appreciate you joining us and we appreciate your contribution. And we'd like to know what you think. And there will be a, uh, um, a time reserved for uh, more uh, responses to the questions you may have put into our chat box. Uh, we'll be sure to get to those. And okay, so um, so yeah, that's interesting. Most of uh, most people uh, feel that we should have ongoing training. Um, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. So okay, so our not next topic, and this is something. But Jane, yes. Jane, before you move on to that next topic, I uh, I just wanted to share a thought. Uh, I had uh, at one of the training that I went EDI training that I've. I, have taken. Um, the speaker said something that has stayed with me, and I and I, I really liked it. And what she said was that I mean, she was making a joke and saying, you know, you come to this training, and it was actually a comprehensive full day training. And afterwards, she said, you know, now you're all, uh, you know, you're all ready to go. And she and everyone laughed. And then she said, actually, this is a continuing process. So it started. Right. Sort of like brushing your teeth. We've come today, we've brushed our teeth, but guess what? You're going to have to brush your teeth every single day for the rest of your life. And it's not the worst thing in the world. Like nobody actually thinks it's a, a big, huge drag that we have to brush our teeth every day. And it's the same way. This is a continuing process, something that is ongoing. It's an ongoing dialogue and an ongoing discussion, ongoing learning. That's great. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. So we can think of our discussion today as some kind of fluoride application. <laughs> so Susanna, um, I'd like you to share with us. You you were talking about lexicon and um, you know developing language. Um, so part of that are the initials and acronyms that we see um, commonly out there and. I mean, a lot of people are confused about what the current um, acceptable um, 
you know, acronyms are, initials are. Can you just speak to us a little bit about that? Yeah, no. Um, so in in the training I give or when I'm having these conversations, because I get to have them every day, um, one thing I always say is there is no exhaustive list. If you're trying to make a list of do's and don'ts, um, please let me know how that goes. I don't think that's a sustainable course of action. Um, and I I really stray away from, from lists in my own training. Um, and I repeat that throughout. I think what's more important is that in, as individuals and as organizations, if your organization has an EDI man, mandate, that we do a couple key things, that we acknowledge where our knowledge gaps are, we work to close those gaps, and we remain aware that specifically in the EDI space, the language is always evolving. So I think of the example for, you know, BIPOC um, came to us a few years ago, and that stood for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. And it was an accessible term. People understood who we were talking about. Essentially, we were saying everybody who is not white. That's what we meant by that acronym. Um, and that was great. Um, but what happens sometimes is that we would be going on doing our EDI work and wanting to have an initiative. And we'd say, well, the audience or the folks we want to amplify with this are BIPOC. And what that meant is we were always talking about all these very diverse groups of people as a group. And when you're trying to affect, I think, long, long-term systems changes, you need to drill down to what are the specific types of bias or harassment or harm that a particular group has faced. And when you're doing that, you're gonna find that there's intersections with various identities. But if you're trying to tackle the problem and you're only talking about the umbrella under which within the problem exists, you're going to miss, I think, doing the kind of work that you really want that's effective. And so it's not that BIPOC is wrong. It's just that, okay, we have this term and that's great and that's accessible, but we need to make sure that if we're talking today about anti-Indigenous racism and how we deal with that in the context of a particular workplace, that that's what we're talking about, that our initiative names that and that we address it directly. I think um, another example in terms of the evolution is equity deserving, which is the term that I, I use now. But not too long ago, folks were we're saying and are still saying sometimes equity seeking. And again, I say there's nothing wrong with the term. So this is not a do or don'ts list. Um, those groups are seeking equity. But when we say equity seeking, we focus on the, the work that the people from those groups are doing to have justice. And when we say equity deserving, we focus the lens on the folks that need to do the work to support them to get that justice. And we share the load better. We divide that burden better around that work. I know another term that's coming in um, to more common use now is equity denied, which is particularly used to focus on the fact that those groups have been equity denied. And again, not none of them are wrong or bad, um, but I think we need to constantly be thinking about um, that there's some discomfort around the language changing, um, that we need to sit with that discomfort for our own learning, um, and that we need to get comfortable with keeping ourselves up to date as part of that journey. Um, I love the analogy that Joe just shared um, in my training. Um, I share that I think we all have sort of EDI muscles and that we need to keep flexing them. Um, I am not someone that keeps up with my gym routine regularly enough, but I say, that you know, would be dope. That would be dope. <laughs> <laughs> but I always say when I am doing what I want to be doing in terms of my workouts, I can feel myself getting stronger and those muscles become muscles that I use even more without thinking about it. And I want, I hope on all of our journeys that we start to flex those muscles more. Um, but I'll leave it there for now. So is there a place, is there a resource that we can look to easily to be able to um, keep ourselves as current as possible? I mean, I wish there was a blogger who was always updating, you know, for us, right, that we can easily reference, but I haven't come across one. Have you? I mean, there probably is a blogger out there doing that, <laughs> that work, um, not one that I could point to. I think identifying resources that are helpful and checking in with them. So I like to use um, the University of British Columbia has an equity um, glossary on their website. It's available and they do update it and explain why they're updating it sometimes around terms. So I love that as an entry point in terms of language or acronyms that we would deem acceptable. Um, but I think also depending on the particular equity deserving group that you're more interested in learning about, keeping on top of the websites that promote that work. So whether it's a gal, for example, in supporting the LGBTQ community, I'd be looking at their website regularly because they do update those resources and then accessing the ones that um, help me in my work or the particular initiatives that I'm trying to support. 
I just like to jump in for a second and say, uh, I think um, with a lot of these terms can become quite um, uh, like a powder keg. Uh, people can get very upset about them. And um, I, for everyone, I think, if you are curious and open-minded and respectful, that's where you can actually learn. So asking, if you have a client in front of you who you don't know what it is that they, what they would like to be referred, you know, by whatever, what, it, you can just be curious. You can be respectful and ask. If you don't use respect, if you aren't curious, if you aren't open-minded, you're going to lose clients. Clients are not going to retain you. Colleagues are not going to want to work with you. Your workmates are not going to have you as in high, as a high regard as they could. So it is, it behooves you to be respectful, open-minded and curious. So on um, our questionnaires, our intake questionnaires, you know, we've changed um, um, the uh, intake questions to ask, just as you say, Joe, you know, what, uh, which pronoun do you identify as? Um, most of us have done that. Um, so, but there are people who have asked me why that's important, why that question is even there. Um, what do you think, Susanna? How would you explain that? I'm, I know I have my own way of explaining things. And sometimes I think I'm getting through uh, to people and other times um, there's a more of a discussion that ensues. Um, how would you answer that in the simplest way possible? Um, I think there are a couple of things to think about there, but in the simplest way possible, um, as a practitioner dealing with, let's say, a client, I think the answer is you want to have a respectful relationship with your client. You want to affirm who they are just as a human being. Um, and in order to do that, knowing the pronouns that they use is important. Um, that's the simplest way possible that I explain that. I'm fresh off of I spent the morning um, at the Center for Sexuality here in Alberta that does a lot of work around trans and non-binary identity. And I think one of the things that comes up is, and I think I might've actually seen this in the chat already, is that on family law files specifically, there are a lot of files with children whose identities are being discussed. And sometimes there are supportive parents or uh, unsupportive parents or other dynamics going on with guardians. And one of the things is, the lack of respect for even be beginning to understand where a child might be coming from or where the other party might be coming from. So I think a basic level of saying, I want to relate to you in whatever interaction you're having really as another human with dignity, then it's important for me to understand how I do that in a way that affirms who you are. Um, and recognizing that when you don't do that, you run the risk of not only not affirming who that person is, but doing further harm depending on what their experiences have been because of their identity. I hope that's simple and accessible. Yeah, no, it wasn't as simple as I <laughs> was fishing for. I'm so really. sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm not, that's not a criticism at all, but it's a lot more interesting um, that, you know, there's a lot to think about there. Um, so I also attended LGBTQ and trans um, sort of, um, uh, working with that, with, working with the community um, over the weekend, and we talked a lot about, um, just as Joe mentioned, you know, respect and, and and coming from a place of understanding, and and I think that we should all, um, you know, be open to um, having not just more dialogue, but open to more education, because there's so much that I learned as a result. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I have been much more open in the last few years because of my own personal um, uh, connection to trans community through a child of mine, but I learned so much, um, you know, so it's a continuous educational process, I think, um, and we all have to be respectful, we have to be open to uh, being wrong, uh, being educated, um, yeah. Um, so I want to take it back a little bit. So I think that in, in implicitly, when we are talking about respect towards not just our clients and the colleagues, we are talking about the consciousness of a 
power balance that might exist um, within those relationships that we're trying to address. So, um, you know, again, Susanna, do you have thoughts on that? Um, is there a power imbalance that uh, are always present that we don't talk about? Is there always implicitly a power imbalance? Um, can you unpack that a little bit for us? I can try and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully give you something that 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 is a little more accessible. Um, yes, I think there are always power imbalances um, inherent in how in how we work as lawyers. So I definitely think with lawyer client relationships, I think with lawyers who are more senior at the bar and those who are more junior at the bar, there are those power imbalances. I think between lawyers and members of the bench, um, there are power imbalances. I think. You know, I like to think of how whoever you are, how you navigate those power imbalances as a sort of pretzeling that you do in whatever workplace or workspace you find yourself. Um, what that means for some people from equity deserving groups is an added sort of mental gymnastics that they do when they are having interactions. So whether they are the client or the lawyer, they may be thinking, okay, is the interaction I'm having what I'm experiencing about my gender? Is it about my race? Is it about my sexuality? Is it about some other part of me um, that's showing up in this workspace? I think when we're wanting to not necessarily remove those power imbalances completely, because I don't think that's possible, but we're wanting to make that space safer for whoever we're at, at interacting with. If we're the one in the position of power, then we can do that, right? Whether it is by letting them know that we respect who they are and we want to know more about their identity, inviting them in to a conversation with us um, in a way that is respectful. Um, you know, I like to talk about listening to respond because I thought when I was in private practice, I thought that a lot of lawyers did that. I, I felt like I would be asking even the simplest of question and, you know, counsel on the other side would, would have an answer and sort of go, I, I don't know that you actually heard the question I asked. Um, and I get that we have to be prepared and think on our feet, but I think a lot of people go through the day listening to respond and not listening necessarily to just learn and sit with that learning. I think there's sometimes this impulse reaction to, oh, I've got some new information, I need to act on it immediately. Um, and I'm a big fan of, of the pause, <laughs> uh, even if it's five seconds, whether that's before you respond or before you hit send or before you even you know, tell a story that you think really connects you to that other person, but might actually be completely unrelated to what they just told you and may further um, widen the gap between, between the relationship you're trying to build. So I think having those things in mind, um, that those power imbalances exist, being aware of how you show up, show up what's your social location in the room? Um, who are you and what do you bring to the table because of who you are? Um, and then how do you make sure that you let that person know that regardless of how they're showing up, that this place is, is safe for them, especially in the lawyer-client relationship? I love you know, that. Yeah, so Jane, also, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. Please. Yeah, um, I think the person who has the power in the power imbalance, some it's very hard to actually notice it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I I love this study from the University of California, and it's called the Monopoly Game Study. If anyone wants to Google it, just University of California Monopoly Game Study. What they did was they set up a game where they took half of the students and they gave them a golden ticket and half the students did not get a golden ticket. And the golden ticket holder started off with twice as much money, two dice, and they uh, every time they went around, they got twice as much money. So the game was set up that the person who gets the golden ticket has to win. And when they first started it, the, the students are, they roll the dice and whoever wins on the dice is the person who gets the golden ticket. So they know it's just a random thing that they start off in a better position. And then they play the game. And after the game is done, what the study, the people who, who organized the study, what they thought was these students, what they would do because they, the ones who got the golden ticket, they would know they got the golden ticket. So they'd give the other students some, some breaks during the game didn't happen. But all of the participants, 100% of the participants, never at the end of the game when they were interviewed why they won, none of them mentioned the two dice, none of them mentioned the extra money, none of them mentioned getting twice as much money and being able to go around the board twice as much. They all said they won because of their skill and a lack of skill by the other player. So they 
even though they knew they were given an advantage in the game, they still couldn't recognize their power in the game. They still attributed uh, their success to themselves and not to sort of how it was set up in the game. It's a really interesting study. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. You're you're talking about privilege and sense of privilege that um, we may or may not always be uh, acknowledging in, in any kind of dialogue or engagement with other people. Um, so check your social location. I'm going to be borrowing a lot of phrases from Susanna from now on. Um, I'm, I'm writing them down and I'm going to be talking uh, to other people as if they were my own. I'm just warning you. Um, so um, I also want to talk about so kind of the values we have in workplace uh, specifically. Um, so I think um, a lot of people might say that having a sense of belonging in a workplace is important to them. It's one of the reasons they, they choose to stay in the work environment where they are. Um, but just getting more down to basics, I mean, what does this notion of belonging look like in the context of the discussion we're having today? Um, Susanna? Yeah. Um, Belonging, yes, because that's one of the other things that's evolving is our acronyms. So I do see a lot of DEIB now, or IDEA plus B, or inclusion and belonging um, in this space. Um, I think belonging is where we want to get to. Um, I think if people are experiencing a true, genuine sense of belonging right now, and they belong to particular equity deserving groups, I would like to talk to them more, um, because I'm interested in how those spaces have been created. Um, given the, the work we have left to do. Um, but if you ask me what that means to me in the workplace specifically, I think that means that you get to, whoever you are, show up as yourself authentically without the fear of reprisal or being shunned or that there would be negative repercussions and the genuine belief that in that workspace you are accepted and celebrated as you are. Um, I think belonging is really part and parcel of equity, diversity, and inclusion. I don't know how we build more inclusive workplaces without people telling us that their sense of belonging increases. Um, but I think that is so much a result of, are we taking the temperature regularly of the people that we work with or our workforces or our teams? Are we really asking them what it means to be here? Um, do they think that there's a cost to belonging here? Are they having to shed parts of themselves to say that they feel like they belong? And what parts are those? Um, so I think belonging is is a ways off for, for many people, um, but I think we're headed in that direction and I hope so. I've always um, struggled with that notion. Um, I mean, we all immediately sense whether or not we are comfortable, we feel a sense of belonging in a place. Um, I've had uh, different struggles in the past with a sense of belonging and, you know, ideally I want to create an environment, whether it be at my firm or in the organizations where I, I choose to contribute my energy um, to try to, you know, um, set up structures where uh, everyone can, uh, you know, can uh, feel a sense of belonging because we've set up certain programs in place. Um, Joe, do you have any thoughts about that? Do you think about that as an employer um, in the organizations that you've uh, belonged to? Yeah, I, I think that first of all, we um, if we don't uh, sort of embrace who we are uh, you know, as a society, as individuals, we end up with, uh, less of a group uh, dynamic, which the, the, the difficulty is that you could be missing out on broader solutions to more creative thinking, uh, to, I mean, if you want to get to the brass tacks of it all, less satisfied clients, less satisfied workmates um, and other colleagues. So it, it just uh, does everyone well in terms of uh, in trying to include yourself and the into the group, your authentic self, and to um, accept other people uh, in, in their authentic selves. 
I know, um, Joe, that you've been doing a lot of work um, at the um, CD Collaborative Divorce um, um, Toronto organization within the um, uh, EDI committee there. Can you tell us a little bit about the initiatives and programs that we've developed? Um, you yeah, uh, I mean, you, you, you asked me to come on to the committee and uh, so I was happy to do that. And so uh, our committee meets uh, once a month uh, by Zoom. And I, you know, the, uh, the, the number of people that attend uh, varies depending on people's uh, availability. And uh, usually we do it for, you know, a brow bag uh, lunch discussion. So we have our lunch while we're having the discussion and we talk about issues for a while there for about six months, we organized a fundraiser uh, to, to build a scholarship fund, uh, which was a lot of fun to do. And it was interesting and we learned an awful lot uh, and we, and it was a great success. So we raised, uh, we were able to raise enough money for five scholarships and um, I, it, it raised awareness of EDI issues within our group um, and within the sponsors that we had, just getting dialogue and people talking about it. And also it provided the scholarships for some students, you know, young people or not young people to uh, enter into the, into the group. It brought awareness uh, of our group, a greater awareness of our group. And um, what we also are trying to do is organize seminars with respect to this for our group or to make ourselves available for other groups and to encourage uh, an EDI lens on the things that we do. And our ultimate goal is to encourage our organization to uh, more closely reflect the community that we serve. Yeah, so part of the reason that I um, participated so um, enthusiastically in these initiatives was about the struggle I've had uh, in the sense of belonging. Uh, as a lot of you know, I'm a collaborative divorce lawyer, so not um, um, so uh, collaborative divorce is a bit of a smaller uh, group within the family law bar. And when I first joined a collaborative divorce Toronto, everyone was very welcoming, but I looked around at the sea of faces and there were very few, not enough of uh, people who not just look like me, but reflected the population, uh, you know, the demographic that we live in. So it has been um, a decade long process actually to um, try to do my part in bringing awareness, uh, not only about CDT to, um, to the family law bar, but to uh, bring EDI awareness within our own community. So. The scholarship initiative Joe mentioned was one of them. Um, yeah, again, it's an ongoing process, you know, flexing your muscles or brushing your teeth every day. Um, <laughs> and some of the things that we hear about, um, you know, while we're having these discussions in our training groups, um, you know, again, I, I write down these terms, but sometimes I'm not 100% sure about what they mean, you know, things like, uh, unconscious bias we have to check, um, microaggressions is a good one, uh, cultural competence, do we have thoughts on, you know, what these things mean, how we can explain it to other people, you know, um, ways not to get panicked when we hear these terms because we have some basic understanding. Again, I'm going to call on you, Susanna, can you please help us? <laughs> I hope I can. Um, yes. So going back to our lexicon and the terms that we have available to us, um, I'll tackle microaggressions first because I remember the first time I heard it, it, as soon as I understood what it was, it resonated with me, but I am very, very critical of, of the term because of how we understand it and use it in the English language. So first of all, microaggression usually refers to a small or unintentional and often commonplace slight that occurs in regular interactions. Um, and they are typically experienced by people who belong to differently, different equity deserving groups. And microaggressions can be verbal. Um, they can be behavioral, behavioral, sorry, they can be environmental. So I think, um, you know, verbal is, you know, constantly mispronouncing someone's name or calling them a name that they did not give you permission to call them. Um, 
you know, complimenting how good someone's English is under the assumption that they're not from an English speaking country, that it's not their first language because of their identity. Um, when I think of behavioral um, things that folks have expressed that have happened in the workplace, um, you know, a, a black colleagues who have expressed always being mistaken as a service worker when they're in the lunchroom, when, when they're uh, the lawyer in the organization, or assuming that a coworker who is in a certain age demographic um, is not going to be tech savvy um, and sort of, you know, checking, checking a box saying, oh, they're not going to be involved in this particular part of the project. Um, when I think of environmental, I think of things like what you said, Jane, looking around the room and not seeing maybe people of color or people with disabilities, um, whether that's in a C-suite or in a community like CDT, um, you know, or what are we naming our rooms after our boardrooms have names? Are we naming them all after, you know, white men in our, our fields? Or are we naming them after um, the land that we occupy? Thinking about how we, how we take up space in that way. Um, personally, uh, I like to say, I don't think there is anything micro about these aggressions. I really do think that the daily onslaught of being othered and having your identity questioned or highlighted in a negative way is actually quite a heavy burden to bear. And so while again, it's the word that we have right now and it's the word that we can access, I want us to always be thinking about the heaviness of people who experience more of those aggressions um, than we might um, and how we can minimize or share that load with them. Um, around unconscious bias um, or, or implicit bias, um, if that's more accessible for you, I think you know those are ideas and preferences that we have um, often about other people or groups of people that we may not be aware of. Um, they can be around things like age, uh, ethnicity, how someone presents. Um, I think of them as attitudes or stereotypes. Um, they can be motivations or assumptions for some people. Um, and they're formed by simply being human. So um, in training that I do around unconscious bias, I always start about talking about how our brains work you know, we have tens of thousands of decisions to make in a day and our brains are supposed to be efficient. They're supposed to sort things into categories. Um, and each of us are influenced by our background, our cultural environment, our professional experiences, the media we consume, our repeat exposure to certain, certain scenarios. So whether that's a courtroom or a particular kind of file. Um, and those start to help us develop what may be stereotypical associations or prejudices, but they become part of our long-term memory. They become part of those reflexes and how we move through the world. And so while it's a natural part of our brain working um, from an evolutionary standpoint, we're supposed to be able to categorize things and, and make decisions quickly. Um, what happens in terms of how we view others or groups of people is that these operate on a subconscious level. Um, they can also often be completely inconsistent with our stated belief, right? Research has shown that uh, what I state to believe out loud may be completely inconsistent with what I hold on a subconscious level, but that's what's impacting my interactions with other people. Um, and when you say, you know, tackling about that or checking that, I think that's another example of ongoing work. Um, I get a question every now and then in my training sessions here um, around well, when does it become a conscious bias? You know, if I'm aware of it now, have I moved it out of unconscious? Am I, is that part of doing the work? Um, and I have an imperfect answer for that um, that works for me is, I, I don't know exactly when that happens because I'm, I'm not a scientist in this area. But what I like to say is, even if I'm aware of it, if I can recognize that it's still operating as a reflex for me, then I think it's still an unconscious bias that I need to be mindful of and keep checking and keep checking how I show up when I have certain interactions and it comes up for me. So even if I'm mindful of, oh, I might have this particular prejudice, if it's still reflex for me, it's still an area where I need to do, where I need to do the work. Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll leave it there for now, I think. I, I, I was just going to agree with you um, because I go around thinking I'm aware more than most people, you know, relative to others. I. I've gone to training, I'm constantly thinking about it, yet I'm constantly surprised, you know, when I put the, put the, um, put on the, like the um, lens of seeing things again from a different angle, I think, wow, you missed that, Jane, uh, you did it again. So um, I, I um, can't agree with you more. I want to say just a 
little bit about this notion of cultural competency. Um, I was at a, again, a training session over the weekend. Um, and um, the major takeaway for me was that the competency that we talk about is not um, a capacity that one has, you know, by oneself. It's really always in dialogue with someone else. So we're talking about competency um, as an intersection of a discussion with the other, whoever it might be that you are engaging with. And the competency you develop is always, you know, evolving um, because it's not a, it's not a um, certificate you get um, as a competent individual, but you're always trying to develop um, in order to become more competent. Uh, you know, every exchange you might have with uh, someone else. Um, you know, Jane, that's really interesting that you're saying that uh, by a, just a great coincidence, I was uh, cleaning out my office yesterday and tossing out the piles of things. And uh, one of the things I came across was a course that I took at the Law Society in 2013 and it was on cultural competency and much of what was I, I was just leafing through it and it was I, I was kind of giggling a bit uh, when I was looking at it because what struck me from uh, and it's it's well it's a long time ago but uh, what struck me from that uh, from that course was that it was almost like they were replacing a whole bunch of uh, they were adding a whole bunch of sort of prejudices to it. So, uh, cause I was thinking you can't judge the individual who's before you by way of some sort of a, uh, a general blanket about another culture. So you, you can't say, you know, all of this group do this type of a thing. Well, but that person in front of you may be a part of that group, but they don't do that thing. Again, I think it's, it's more a question of, being curious and asking questions and being open-minded and respectful. That's right. Okay, so I was just opening up um, some of the questions that the audience had. Um, so I we're not completely finished uh, our discussion, but I just want to uh, go quickly to one of the questions was, we are seeing more family court cases with parents and kids who are non-binary and or trans uh, identifying. Um, and the question is, do you think we have done enough training in these areas? And uh, my answer would be absolutely not. I mean, because, you know, we are, so, everyone is still learning about, um, um, you know, I, not only individuals who identify uh, within this community, but about how, you know, we engage in a, in a loving space with them. Um, and I myself haven't seen enough training in this area for, for lawyers uh, or any, uh, any professional who engage, uh, you know, with this community. Um, as I said, I learned a lot over the weekend. Um, um, do you know, Susanna, if there are um, training resources that we can go to? Yeah, I mean, immediately um, two resources come to mind. So where I spent my morning with the Center of Sexuality um, here in Alberta, but of course, I'm, I'm sure they have virtual capabilities for those who are not here in Alberta. Um, but just again, going to their website, even to sort of look at materials to see what what might work for your organization or having them build something custom. And I'm not sponsored by them in any way. I'm just really, truly fresh off of, of a breakfast <laughs> done this morning. So it's, a, it's on my mind um, if there's something similar in Ontario. Um, I think of folks like Be A Dare, who is at Be A Dare Consulting, who specifically focuses on trans issues and trans experiences um, and does connect with lawyers around that work. Um, but the question was, you know, do we have enough training? And I, um, no, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I would love to work myself out of a job um, because I'd like to retire at what I think is relatively young. Um, um, but I'd also like it to mean that we don't have to think about these issues anymore because we've dealt with them all, right? We've removed the barriers, the systems are working for all of us because um, we've, we've built them in a way that does. So no, I don't think we have enough training in these areas. I think the lawyers who are being curious and want to find that training, I commend you 
because I do think you'll be ahead of the game um, and someone else can make the business case for that. Um, I don't need to do that, but I think you will you will be more helpful um, to folks. And it doesn't just mean that, oh, it's helpful to this file because that's who's in front of me. I think just having that knowledge and that understanding and how you operate within your legal community, even with your colleagues, is going to be improved by you expanding what's in your toolkit. Um, you know, I always believe that you can add more tools to the toolkit, and I don't think there's a one solution fits all. So I think continuing that educational journey, finding the training, and for those of you who are truly ambitious, building the training in a way that you know that your colleagues will be able to access and understand and practically apply. I did meet someone wonderful from the States that I want to invite um, here. I, so I am thinking of building the training that we're lacking in our, um, in our province. Um, so moving uh, the conversation slightly over to sort of the employer obligations of uh, offering training, do we have specific obligations? Um, I did look up LSO um, information and it didn't seem to me that there were specific obligations. I think, of course, most of us know we all have to um, fulfill three hours of EDI training. Um, and of course, this, this um, presentation uh, will count towards one of those hours. Um, but do you think, do you have any thoughts on that, Joe? Well, I, I think outside of, of course, our obligations under the human rights uh, legislation, which uh, governs on both provincial and on federal levels. Um, I, I mean, we're all well aware of, of that kind of basic um, requirement in terms of our employees, but it, it just general good behavior in, uh, in terms of dealing with other people. It, it doesn't have to just be your employee, but um, it, why on earth would we purposefully want to harm another person? Like that, that just doesn't make any sense. I remember from uh, first year torts class, it was quite a long time ago, uh, Professor Fudge actually was her name. Uh, her, uh, one of the things that she said was in religious law, the expression is love one another and in a secular way, so the way that the secular law uh, defines that is do no harm. And, you know, that's how we should be governing ourselves, which is do no harm. Susanna, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, no, no, I don't. I think that was really well said. I like the do no harm. Um, yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Joe. Um, if anyone else has questions, please, I invite you to send those to us. Um, we had another question uh, from someone who wanted to, I think, talk a little bit more about unconscious bias. I'm not sure we have enough time to do that. Um, and when the question was where um, or where do you feel the origins of unconscious bias comes from? I think maybe they're referring, this question is referring to the concept of unconscious bias or, um, Susanna, do we have thoughts on this? I do have thoughts. This is one of those moments where um, I wish we were having a bit more of a discussion because I would be yeah. just asking, what do you mean by that? So if you're talking about the concept, then I think it goes back to my answer of it's the way your brain works. Your brain is meant to categorize things. And so it all that includes people and the interactions you have and repeat exposure often lands you with having particularly prepared responses or reactions to that. And they happen in milliseconds, right? The research around unconscious bias in the brain says that you, you, you have a stress response to things that are unfamiliar. And that includes, so it's not just, oh, I'm in a city and I'm lost. For some people, it means um, there's a black doctor in front of me. That's unfamiliar. You're having the same stress response. The researchers say, again, I am not a scientist. Um, if, if someone's talking about the kinds of unconscious bias that we identify, so, you know, a gender bias that's prevalent in the workplace or something like that, um, that, that we're saying these are not good and we need to eradicate them, then I think those come from us being human, right? And our 
our our our nature in terms of oh we we might discriminate because something needs to be helpful or harmful that's a good thing our brain's helping us do that but then we also may end up doing that in ways that harm groups of people or individuals that we interact with so i i hope in some way i've i've answered their question um yeah, I think the question again um, comes from a place where, you know, we're a little bit confused about what we're supposed to think when we hear these charms, but you've explained it so beautifully, Susanna, um, you know, both, um, both, uh, you know, how we process information and, you know, about um, where the concept of um, discussing these kind of notions um, originated for lack of a better word uh, or started um, okay thank you so much Joe do you have some parting words <laughs> I did want to leave one parting comment though for which is I do a lot of work with children in my role as counsel for the office of the children's lawyer and uh, it's a, a a joy of mine to work with the children obviously uh, the children or maybe it's not obvious but the children are, are often in very distressed situations because uh, most of it is with respect to children's aids children aid uh, uh, cases but uh, what I would say to everyone is in my uh, working with these children which I've done for over 15 years uh, one of my takeaways from meeting so many children is how they are these empty vessels that are filled up with other, with either lots of love and support or a lot of vile, horrible things, and it's. I really feel like we all have an opportunity with all of our young people in our community to at least be one, one little tiny bit of good for each child that we interact with. Um, if everyone did that, uh, I think we'd be in a lot better position. Anyway. That's my little soapbox. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank both of you again, Joe, Susanna. This was a wonderful conversation, one that I want to continue having with the two of you and others. Um, and I'm now I'm gonna just take it back to you, uh, Shannon. Um, and I want to thank, of course, everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Susanna and Joe, for sharing your perspectives and your experiences and um, it was very moving and I know I have a lot to sit with and um, have learned so much today so I really appreciate it. Um, one thing I did have to cut the bios a bit short at the beginning but one thing I do want to mention and call out is um, Susanna is a published poet among other really great um, anti-racism and EDI work um, and I just want to say that it really it really comes through with your messages and it was very powerful so thank you so much thanks and Jen. thanks again Joe and Jane thank you <laughs>